Real, real quick, funny story. My employees have iPhones, but for some reason, a couple of them had my iCloud ID, and I thought I had turned off all the iCloud things, but I guess I didn't on reminders. Like I kept forgetting the kids need to take showers like every other night or something. And I put it in as a reminder to remind me at like six o'clock. And one of my employees that texts me is like, dude, I thought you had your shit together. Why do you need a reminder to take a shower? Because I just put take shower. And it, oh, it was uh, hygiene is your friend. Yeah. Uh, it's hysterical. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. Well, it's here. It's the final Bourbon Community Roundtable of the Year, number 75. And in this episode, we focus on one major topic and then end the show looking back at this year in bourbon. Last week, the team at Breaking Bourbon came out with an excellent article called Does Bourbon Have a Small Brand Problem? It was a fascinating one because it talked about many of the interesting things that we all see about craft brands. Are people only interested in heritage brands? Is there just a knowledge gap? Or is there a problem because of an unfair playing field with the three-tier system? Heck, we can keep going. Are there too many choices? Or do brands just lack hype? In the last part of the show, I revisit all of our 2022 predictions to see who got it right and who got it wrong. But with that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea doesn't come from any one particular person, but there's a sense of frustration out there that people are overwhelmed with all the bourbons on the shelf. Uh, They're tired of seeing uh, bourbons coming in at $200 to start off. Uh, They're tired of not being able to get what they want. And then they get, you know, to add to that frustration, they see me or someone like me on YouTube, you know, review a product that they know that they can't get. And whether I like it or don't like it, they feel frustrated because that whiskey's not hitting their lips. And so they ask, simply ask the question, why am I still doing this? Why is it like this? Bourbon's not fun anymore. And, and that's actually, you know, it's sad but true, but bourbon is losing a lot of that kind of joy for people. And so here's my advice. If you find yourself in that position, first of all, I, even though this would go against, you know, (laughs) my own, what I do, like I cover bourbon for a living. I try to educate people. I I want you to watch, uh, watch my videos and read my books and listen to my podcasts. But if you find yourself just aggravated with me or other reviewers, don't watch us. Don't uh, give yourself that opportunity to get get pissed off at the situation because bourbon is not about like it, it's not a, it's not meant to be something dangled over you saying like ooh you can get this. That's not what it's meant to be. You know, find that you know group that you like to hang out with. And I gotta tell you, I, yeah, I have access to all the bourbon in the world. But you know what I drink at home? It's Wild Turkey 101. It's Rare Breed, Old Forester 1920, Four Roses Single Barrel. Folks, I'm here to tell you that if you are caught up in the allocation game, then that's bourbon done wrong. That's not what bourbon's about. Bourbon, is, to me, is about those everyday pours. And I would put Evan Williams Bottled and Bond and Knob Creek 9-Year-Old up against every single one of those $200 products coming out on the shelves. And I have. I do it all the time. And you know what? The cheaper bourbons usually win. And sometimes they come really close to winning. So if you find yourself in those situations, and I and I hope that, you know, my reviews are not, you know, causing you to gouge your eyes out. I mean, that would be awful. But, you know, don't watch me. Don't watch people who, you know, put you in that position where you find yourself hating bourbon because that's not good, you know. And if you do find yourself leaving the hobby, like I did uh, when I wrote Rum Curious or wrote Mead, you know, I got I get frustrated too. I've gotten frustrated at myself. And if, if you try to measure your enjoyment of bourbon by the bottles that you can get, then you will never find yourself happy. You will never find yourself happy in a hobby that is really about spending time with friends and loved ones with something in your glass. So I don't know where you are, uh, listener, whoever you are, 
the several people out there who have written me uh, about this frustration. Just remember, it's not about that allocate a bottle. It's about the people you share it with. And uh, I hope one day, you know, you and I can uh, share a drink together as well. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea, if you want your name read or not, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the idea, I'll read it on the air. Till next week. Cheers. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com And you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Welcome, everybody. We're back with the final bourbon community roundtable of the year. And this is going to be a fun one because I really enjoyed there was an article that Eric from Breaking Bourbon came out with earlier this week that we're really going to dissect and dive into because I feel that it's just it's so opportune and it's the right time because it also might even fit in with some of the 2022 predictions that all of us had at the very beginning of the year. So I dug those up. To try to oh, figure God. out who did it right and maybe who got it wrong, so we'll we'll see what's happening there. But I'm uh, I'm excited to be able to have everybody on here tonight, except one person who is breaking the streak. I believe we'll see if he pops his head in. But Blake is now he made it to 74, but 75 it, it was just too much. Mm-hmm. All those cable problems, and <laughs> just it just was too much. He couldn't bear, couldn't bear the burden of a proper USB cable in a microphone. <laughs> too much. It really is. But let's go ahead and uh, let's get it kicked off. So you heard Ryan, but Fred's here tonight too. What's up, everybody? Got my, I got my <laughs> mix of uh, the delay. <laughs> ooh, do I have a delay? Uh, I'm trying to show my shirt off here. There we go. There we go. Now keep your shirt on. <laughs> they can see it through the radio right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a fine custom fitted uh, sweater from Bourbon Pursuit where you can. We have the finest fashion here at Bourbon Pursuit. 
And it's also available on our swag store, bourbonpursuit.com slash shop. Mm-hmm. Go there. Nice, nice little plug. Way to go there. Appreciate it, Fred. But we'll also include everybody else around here. So Brian from Sipping Corn. <laughs> yeah, I had the delay too. Sorry, guys. Uh, trying to unmute. Uh, Brian was sipping corn, bourbon justice, all that jazz. Uh, sad, sad to not have Blake, but glad to be with you all for 75 and the holiday show. And I was telling Jordan before we were kicking off, he was posting all of his Duke pictures this past week. So not only is it the holidays, but it's the UK holidays. So oh, go Cats. Ooh, the rival's going deep now. Go ahead, Jordan. Oh, all right. So this is Jordan uh, from BreakingBourbon.com, one of the three guys who runs the site. Happy to be here. Looking forward to diving into Eric's article, and this will be a really good year-end wrap-up. Let's do oh, this. Oh, for sure, for sure. And this is, again, thank you all for being here. Thanks, everybody, that's tuning in right now. If you have some questions that you want to put in the chat and have us go with it, make sure you put them there and we will do it as we continue on here. So let's go ahead and let's dive in with the first topic. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, this was really sparked from a article that's most recent one on Breaking Bourbon. You could have got it if you're on their email list. Make sure you go and check it out. But the title of the article is Does Bourbon Have a Small Brand Problem? So again, shout out to Eric for making this. I'm going to read just a little bit from here to set the stage for me that hasn't read to it. And then we'll start diving into the individual components. So Eric said that at a recent get together, everyone was asked to bring a bottle of bourbon and being a group of friends that drinks together on occasion, and it's all usually bourbon, they're pretty comfortable bringing some of their better or more rare bottles along that no one would probably overindulge. And as the bottle started to fill a table, a curious situation started to unfold. One by one, each bottle was from a major distillery without a craft or small brand bottle in sight. Being someone that is exposed to a wide range of whiskeys, I brought something different off the beaten path that seemed to be deemed worthy of the group's attention. While I didn't go out of my way to sell the bottle I brought in any particular showmanship way, I left it to speak for itself. As the night unfolded and the bottle levels dropped, my bottle remained the least touched. This event made me wonder if bourbon has a small brand problem. In a setting of like-minded whiskey drinkers where money wasn't involved, the least known bottle that group sat untouched and unloved. And he goes, even speaking with liquor store owners, they are saying that getting customers to try anything beyond the major distilleries is quickly becoming not worth the effort it takes. He says they even see it on Breaking Bourbon too. They do their best to cover a wide range of releases, everything from the latest major distillery to the maturing craft distilleries and to the local bourbon that can't be found outside of the particular state it's made in. But more often than not, it's not from a major distillery. People don't seem to care in large numbers. So there's a lot to unpack that we're going to start going into this. And it's true. We, we also see it on the bourbon pursuit side. We kind of stopped doing a lot of stuff in the craft whiskey world a while ago in regards of having master distillers on the show or anything like that or talking about it only because it just didn't pull the numbers. It didn't seem like people cared about it. It's always the your Heaven Hills, your Four Roses, your Jim Beams, everything like that, that people seem to start gravitating towards. So before we start diving into some of the individual topics, does anyone want to kind of give some initial thoughts to this? All right, I'll, I'll dive in since it's our our, our article. So it was really interesting when Eric brought this concept to us, right? We've been talking about this consistently on Breaking Bourbon for years now, and, and Kenny just mentioned it. You know, we notice we we religiously track our site traffic, and we just notice when it's not from a big brand, people just don't care. Yeah, it's really interesting when we interact with a lot of folks on social media or via emails that come in every day, a lot of people talk about the small brands that they love in their home state. And I think, you know, what it goes to show is the mass majority of folks as we're talking and Eric finally said, here's a straw that broke the camel's back. Exactly as Kenny set it up, I went to this party, brought a craft bottle. And we we thankfully do have access to a lot of craft bottles that you may not find in your home state, you may not find in your market. You could probably find it online if you want. A lot of them are sent to us for review as samples and you probably wouldn't pull the trigger at the price to buy those. And that's okay. So we, we try a lot of stuff. Some's not good. Some's really interesting and unique. As we really started dissecting, as Eric started coming up with this article, we really talked about the three of us, you know, why are people doing this? And he listed out like seven or eight main points in the article. And it's a great, great opinion piece. If you haven't read it yet, go to the site and check it out. Um, but it really got us thinking, you know, what 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 is driving folks away from craft? And and those seven points or eight points that Eric laid out really were the catalyst of the conversation between us that started the article and more so as we started noticing all of the interactions afterwards on social media and the emails and the comments on the website from all walks of life. We had a few small craft distillers chime in 
they agreed with it. A lot of people started comparing it to the craft beer industry, but flipping that perspective on its head, where with the craft beer world, when that came about, it's because large beer, those large conglomerates, they sucked. Everything that was out there was just the same, very homogenous, just nobody really wanted to, to do anything new. Craft came along, they revolutionized the beer world for the American consumer and the American palate. The opposite is taking place in the bourbon world. So the large established brands, yeah, there's some stuff that you might not like, but for the most part, they usually put out something decent and sometimes something really decent. So now what Kraft's trying to do is what they're trying to put out is already starting at a point where it's hard to beat the, the entrenched competition. And it's even harder for consumers to consistently give you money over and over and over again to try new things. It's just one of those things, and is you know we encourage our own readers and encourage all the listeners to burn pursue um, to think about the same thing as you know why don't I try craft more and really what's the issue here and I think you know more craft distillers need to be tuning into this conversation to really think about well, what are we in this for? Are we in this just to make a buck? Are we in this to change consumers' minds? And really, what are people needing to see? It's a rough industry to be in, right? And I'm sure Kenny and Ryan can talk about that. There's a long lead time to starting up and being really entrenched with a lot of good product in the pipeline. When you start off sometimes, especially if you're distilling and not sourcing, it's really hard to get your product to a level that consumers are used to, thanks to really cheap, decent bourbon from Heaven Hill, Buffalo Trace. So I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the folks um, and, and let them give their opinions. I love to hear it as I loved reading all the opinions on the article. Um, but it's just a really, it's one of those conundrums, like how does craft slowly, you know, build that confidence and that consumer trust so that they can move from craft to maybe a bigger brand or maybe not even move from craft, but just move to this is a brand I'm seeking out. And that's such a rarity nowadays in, in the um, bourbon world. You know, we were at a whiskey advocate. I think we, we wrote about this. I want to say eight years ago when I was there and there were round tables about this, like industry conferences and stuff. And this is, this has been a, this has been a pretty prominent issue for, for a decade. And these, these small distillers have kind of accepted, they've kind of accepted it. Like you, like Benny's is just like, they can't take another pitch, right. About, about a new craft brand. And when um, what what I have noticed now, and you all may get this too, Jordan, is that when I do recommend a craft product, I mean, I will have people just be like, "I've, you know, you, you got this wrong." Like I, I recommend Spirits of French Lick a lot. Like I like that brand a lot. Uh, I like Journeyman a lot. I mean, they just won our uh, best whiskey at the Ascots, and I, I love those two products. And there'll be people who get the bottle and then they're like, I hate this because it has this note. I don't like that. And it's a matter of like people don't want to explore outside of their comfort zone. And I really don't think a lot of people read tasting notes. I really don't. I think I think they just see something won an award or it got recommended by someone. They don't actually read or watch what someone wrote or said. And I think that's part of the problem. And it's it's a it's a matter of like the consumer base is is has been geared toward a particular flavor wheelhouse and all the marketing is coming from Jim Beam, Heaven Hill, Sazerac, Four Roses, Wild Turkey. And uh these smaller guys, they just can't they can't market. And it's a shame that Blake's not here because he's re he's really you know, in my opinion, probably the biggest advocate of the last decade for these smaller brands. I mean, Sealbox was created to give those people a voice and access to our audiences. And I think he's done a better job than anybody of telling the, uh, the craft stilling story. So this is, this is something that these brands have been dealing with. They know if, if they've been in this game for uh, a little bit of time, they know how to roll with the punches. And the, the key here is the slow allowance of shipping. When these distillers are able to build their own audiences and reach their own consumers, there's not a small brand problem. You know, they, they, have, a, they have access to people who want their product. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the eyes of the general consumer and it's it's about education. It's about exploring your palate. And if you taste the same damn thing every day 
or in the same kind of wheelhouse, you'll never grow as a, uh, as a taster. Yeah. Jordan, when this article came out and it was like, I think they've been listening to Kenny and I's past conversations over the past like year, you know, with, uh, starting our own, uh, brand and whatnot, we've kind of found this out that, you know, there is this problem of, uh, people are very, I shouldn't say closed minded. They're just very uh, confident, you know, and you know what the, the major six distilleries are doing and rightfully so they make fantastic whiskey and at usually at affordable price. And, you know, it's hard for new brands to compete with that, you know, whereas craft beer, you can go from fermentation to bottle within a few days, you know, with this, it takes years and years of capital and legwork to get it going. And even when you release your first product to try to recoup some money back, it's not always the best representation that you want to put out there, but you have to, to get some money. And so it's, it's, it's very challenging. And to the, you all covered some fantastic points. The, the, the one that really, you know, disturbs me is the, the how unfair the, the three tier system is for, uh, you know, and that's, and I'm not whining because we're dealing with it. It it just really is unfair for a lot of even medium to small size brands. It's, and not just craft, it's uh, the distribu- distribution game and the things you have to do to get your product on the shelves. You know, you can get a distributor convinced to say, okay, we like your brand, but then that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to put it on the shelf. You know, they may buy it, but that doesn't mean it's going to get on the shelves to where consumers can absolutely e- even try it. And so, you know, it, it's very challenging. And I've gone to parties too where the same exact damn thing has happened. You know, <laughs> you bring, I'm the curious drinker and I'm like, everybody's bringing a Weller, you know, foolproof or a Russell's pick and uh Elijah Craig barrel, which those are all fantastic whiskeys and they're great, but I've had them a thousand times and it bores me to death really. And I'd rather go to a party where somebody brings that rare craft startup brand or even if they're sourcing something that's new and unique and i think i think the problem is too is we're just kind of that's where we are at with a lot of people a lot of consumers are new in this space and i was i was thinking about this i was the same way you know probably six seven years ago kenny i know was he's like kentucky or die you know george t stag or i'm (laughs) like don't even talk to me don't even talk to me and I, i think we just have so many new people in the space that they're still like they're still in that excitement mode of where they're like still excited about hunting and finding the the rare unicorns of the major distilleries and and i I do think there'll be probably a shift because hell i started my own brand because i got tired of chasing you know (laughs) camping and chasing and finding the whiskey that i liked and that's why kenny and i started a brand but i think that's just where we're at and where consumer there's so many new consumers that we're still kind of waiting for them to get fatigued by, you know, the, the camping, the excitement, the letting down of not being able to acquire these, uh, legacy distillery, you know, rare releases. And I do think there'll be a shift and there. I think some minds are turning and changing, you know, smoke wagons, proven that Penelope's proven that blue run to a degree where people are going out on limb. There's that Ben holiday brand that was discussed in the article. There's, they got a really cult like following that's um and i think there'll be a shift but it's gonna be slow and it's it's gonna be huffing if you haven't already started to lay the groundwork two to three years ago i think it's gonna be very very hard for new brands to get in this space because it is so crowded and it is so noisy and it's hard to to make your name stick out in the this crowd space because there's case stacks of all the big brands surrounding you know, all the bottles on the shelves and they, they're paying for placement and they're paying for case deals and all this stuff to really squash out the little brands that can't, they need every ounce of margin in those cases, but other companies can outspend the small companies to squeeze them out. So I'm rambling and packed a lot into this response, but it's the things that I've learned and noticed just uh, starting a brand here. Uh, you're totally right on it. It's a, it's a long-term play though. And just looking back at me, like you just were looking back to what I was thinking six, seven years ago, my test was, is this craft any better than my 1199 six year heaven Hill bottle and bond? And if it wasn't, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get another bottle. Um, 
I just had a a one of those six year bottles at a bottle and bond tasting, and actually, I didn't really like it this time around. And so it's kind of funny for me to see that as my former standard. And now what I think I'm seeing is there's a lot better bourbon out there from these small distilleries than there was even six years ago. So there's a lot of progress. I think that's going to help change people's mind. People on the comments are all talking about Alan Bishop and, and you guys mentioned Spirits of French Lick. You know, that's helping turning the tide. Um, there's just so much better whiskey coming out of these small distilleries now than there used to be, but it's a long-term play. It's unlike beer where you can have, not, not only can you turn around and have a beer, but you can hit big on it pretty quick and then make another one. And here you've just got to wait. You've got to prove your worth. And we're finally having some distilleries get through the system and prove their worth. And some other ones, Still, not so much that I still won't touch. One one quick point, and I'll jump in there. Um, it's funny they made that comment, Brian. You know, you you can have a beer, right? So the difference, and and Eric and I talked about this a lot before the article and the opinion went live. Is the tough part is so everyone who's listening to this podcast right now, you love whiskey, or else you would not be listening to the number one bourbon podcast out there. Um, we wouldn't be talking about it if if the five of us on this podcast didn't love whiskey. But we represent, even all the listeners, all of our followers, everyone, we represent such a small amount of the consumer base. So the majority of consumers in America, they don't have a, a whiskey shelf, a whiskey closet, a whiskey room, How you know, hundreds of bottles, even, even 10 or 20 bottles. They might only have one or three. And with craft beer, yeah, okay, I'll buy a four pack. I don't like it. It'll be gone in two weeks. Some people might only buy one to three bottles a year. So they got burned once, unfortunately, by people who tried laying down the roads to craft five years ago. Oh. You know, I only buy bourbon mm, two, three times a year. Do I want to go get a bottle that I'm going to take a chance on? Or am I going to try something new, right? And unfortunately, the, the bars may not have a lot of the craft stuff that the store does. So it's that uphill battle of not only getting consumers to buy it, but the consumers who have such limited purchasing power a year in terms of, while well, I only have space on my small little bar cart or the shelf in my kitchen closet, nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but I'm just going to keep one or two bottles, maybe three, and I'll go through them. Maybe maybe I'll go through those three in a year. That's a really hard uphill battle to face right there. And that that's a lot of what um, I think we often forget as diehard whiskey lovers is that we're not the average consumer by any means of the by any means of the way, right? <laughs> we're far from it. Right? <laughs> we're very far from it. But we're often we, 50 you know, a year. <laughs> because everyone, everyone in this, everyone on this podcast, everyone listening to it, we're all in that in that insular, you know, that circular world of just whiskey. And, and I'm sure everyone's on the Facebook groups and different social medias. And all they do is talk about whiskey and think about whiskey. The average consumer is not like that. So we often, because we're in the world so much, we think, oh yeah, this is what everyone does. We're, we're far, far from it. Um, and that's, that's a tough battle to, you know, especially Kenny and, and Ryan, I'm sure you guys are seeing that's a tough battle to try and try and face. Yeah. But one thing, you know, Brian mentioned kind of, it's like, we don't know with these big distilleries scaling like they are, I, I don't care who you are. And I, I haven't been in business long, but when you scale, you have to compromise call it quality somewhere. I don't care what business you are. You know, the even the biggest, best national chain restaurants compromise quality somewhere to get where they are. And I, I don't know if you're going to start seeing that and where craft can maybe start to like take over that some of the premium spaces. I don't know. It's, uh, when you start pumping up that much juice and you have these much bigger warehouses, these are things that these distillers haven't dealt with before, you know, and how is the whiskey going to be? Cause they haven't produced as much and stored this much and batched this much, you know, ever before. How is that quality going to continue? I guess, moving forward. That's a interesting take. I think we'll, we'll find, well, let's go ahead and answer that. I'm going to put a, a marker on this so we can come back in six years and see if you're right or not. Oh, probably not. Probably I'm, not. I'm wrong in every. I'm. <laughs> I get one out of ten things right in my life. That's about my ratio. But but here's the thing. Even with that, we're still and, and most craft brands are going to be at a disadvantage, no matter which way you you start turning this. And I really liked what you said first about maybe we were the. I would say we're probably the second wave that got out of chasing after Blanton's and Weller and everything like that. And don't be wrong if it's in front of me. Yeah, I'll see it. I'll probably have a drink of it you know, I'm guilty of that too. But now that more people are getting into this, you do see more people eventually exiting because either they've acquired so much or they don't want to chase it anymore. 
we're not the ones that are waiting in lines at stores in the morning or anything like that. So you will see that eventually probably tail off as either more people get into it and more people go out. It just continues to be a revolving door of this to, to go on some of those other points that were made inside the article. You know, there was another recent, uh, I think it was a thing. I, I know I was on it. I think Nick was on it too about the American craft spirits association when they came yeah. out with all their latest numbers. And I think there's a little bit over 2,600 craft distillers now in the United States. I mean, that is, that is a shocking number. And when you start thinking of of how many craft distillers there are, and you start thinking of, oh, crap, are we going back to where we were before? Because I'll kind of spill the beans a little bit. When we talked about our 2022 predictions, we started saying, this might be the year for craft because, hey, it's, we're in like four to six year range for a lot of these things. They're going to start coming out. And now it feels like it's just starting over again because there's be more people that are coming to market, more people trying to make the names for themselves, more people that are going to try and create a product that's going to try to gain mind share. But as was mentioned in the article, there is there is a lack of trust in the day because we've all been burned by a bad bottle of whiskey at some point. And it doesn't take you too long to go, eh, I, I'm not going to do that. I'd rather go get my rare breed or I'll get my Elijah Craig because I know exactly where it's coming from. I know where the consistency is. And I don't have time to spend on 2,600 distilleries to go and figure out where I got it right or where I'm going to get it wrong. And even if I'm not going to figure out if I get it right or get it wrong, I mean, just going back in the article, there's just there's there's not enough information to be able to get out there. And there's not enough ability for you to spread your message fast enough either, because if there is a consumer that's going to be in the aisle and they are looking at a bottle and if they don't sit there and pull up breakingbourbon.com to figure out what the review is, well, they're just going to go to whatever's familiar. They're going to go with whatever they've they've had before. Or what somebody else has talked about. I think that's probably one of the, the greatest points in this whole entire thing is freaking hype. If the hype train is not behind it, people aren't going to get it. You look at what happened to Smoke Whack and you look at happened to Blue Run. You look at happened to some of these smaller brands that blew up overnight. It's hype. It's not because it's the greatest whiskey in the world. They have good whiskey, but it's hype. And you, you got to be Fred's number two. Exactly. <laughs> if, you're on, if you're on Fred's top 100 list, but if you're not, because number one's untainable, but number two, you can usually get. So you gotta go and find that one. Uh, but I mean, that's what you look at and you think, I mean, that's, that's all a word of mouth marketing right there, because as much as you want to look at people going around and chasing after Weller and just trying to find it, put it on the shelves and they got six things, a green label, well, they're going to go out and get a bottle of smoke wagon, not because they know about it. It's because they saw somebody else talking about it or they saw somebody else picking it up and talking about it. And it is just this it is this this huge thing of like you just got to get hooked into whatever that that magic dust is that just gets you in the, the, the circles to be talking about, because it's really hard to just do it on your own. As I think what Fred had mentioned very early on is that it's budget, it's marketing dollars and it's spend. And there is absolutely no way that any small brand can come and compete with a Diageo or a Constellation or a Beam Centauri. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus Magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point-of-sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, 
Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. And go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. I think what Fred had mentioned very early on is that it's budget, it's marketing dollars, and it's spend. And there is absolutely no way that any small brand can come and compete with a Diageo or a Constellation or a Beam Centauri. There's no freaking way that you can do a national campaign like that. And it's it's just one of those things that, you know, you have to just maybe sit there and work in your own backyard and then build out from there. I think that's maybe the only way of survival at the end of the day is because you've got to bank on the people that are there that are in your community or that just happened to walk up on your doorstep or, you know, thank heavens that somebody else talked about it and told somebody else and they came and showed up too. And you've got to make a customer one at a time instead of one to many. Can you have a community whiskey? I mean, that's, that sounds like beer, you know, community whiskey is tough, you know, to keep, to, to, to only serve your community or your state or something like that. Well, here's a, and I'm going to, so Kenny well, mentioned, Texas does it pretty well. Yeah. And Kenny mentioned that. So I was on that call with you too, Kenny, that, that economics for the craft, right? And we have the PowerPoint you can download on our website, but here's the main stat that I think blew me away the most, Brian, and, and talking about community. So 92% of the business of small craft producers takes place in their home state. So, and I, you know, when I read, or when I heard that, I was like, wow, okay, so that's, that's an uphill battle. So in that case, if you know you're small enough and you don't have a shot at national, you better really build out your community really hard. Cause then if your community doesn't like you, you are going nowhere. You are dead in the water. And that was a, that was a super fascinating stand. They talked about medium, you know, medium 59.1% of their business is still in their home state and large finally eclipses that. So the majority of the business is outside their home state. So a lot of craft distillers though are trying to play for that community aspect or else if they're not, Boy, they're they're not going to make it long. That's for sure. I think the best example of like going after that community aspect is uh, Cedar Ridge. Cedar Ridge is the number one selling bourbon in Iowa, and they really fought for that. And man, I uh, the craft brands that are trying to get in the the back bar in New York uh, and in Las Vegas, you know, they learn real quickly that that ain't going to play. You know, you've just, you cannot compete with those folks. So you have to build your base. And there's a lot of tools out there now for people to do it. Uh, You know, when we talk about Smoke Wagon and you talk about Blue Run, what are they, what is their whiskey? I mean, their whiskey is coming from great distilleries. You know, it's not like, it's not like a craft brand. I think, I think NDPs have a better Building a brand through the NDP model can fare a lot more, lot, lot more successfully than trying to build a distillery and create like a new flavor profile. And these small brands that are NDPs, uh, I think that they they have a better ability to capture those people who are just drinking Elijah Craig because their flavor profiles are not that different. However, or they're exactly when, the same as everybody exactly else. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that another one while you're mentioned there is Old Carter is another great one. They can put out mm-hmm. stuff with double digit numbers on it and it it gets a huge following. Yeah, and, and that's just it is is like it comes down to and someone put it in the chat and I'm glad they did. It the it, it's important to note that you can sell the first bottle but the whiskey has to sell it itself as, for the second one. Jim Rutledge has said that for forever. And like you have all these celebrities coming out with different whiskeys. You know, I hate to tell, I hate to tell people, but those celebrity brands are not flying off the shelves. You know, they're not flying off the shelves because the inner workings of the deals make them, um, make them difficult to fly off the shelves. The only one that's really moving successfully is brothers bond, you know, brothers bond is like crushing it because Ian and Paul are out there, with their kajillion of followers and all the women who love them from vampire diary days, just saying like, buy this and they just go buy it. But, um, you know, that's influence right there. That's, that's the, the OG influence. But I think this, uh, this conversation, you know, I think the next phase of it is like, 
who's is this going to lead to people going out of business? And the answer is yes, because there's just so many brands. Uh, Ryan mentioned this. It, it's so dadgum crowded. It's so crowded and it's just not, it's just so hard. And like, I mean, right now, you know, I'm, I'm trying to compile my top 100 and I'm like, I've tasted this year, I have tasted 700 and like 48 uh, different expressions of American whiskey. And I'm looking through the list. I'm like, I haven't tasted this, 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 and this. I mean, I've, I feel like I've got another hundred before I can even like fully put out that list. And there's just so much, so many blends, so many finishes. So there's so much stuff going on. I mean, I can't keep up. And this is what I do for a living. I can't keep up. I think so. So making a point, one, I agree with you, Fred, the influx in the market is ridiculous, especially if you're trying to review and share opinions on it. Um, but going back to your point about, and I'm just thinking about maybe this will be predictions for 2023 and beyond, but going back to your point about, you know, small craft distilleries, maybe going out of business and not to make this a love fest, but if you're able to be a really good blender and you're able to do something like, I mean, Ryan's really honing his blending skills and he's a very good blender, right? And you look at like trip over a barrel. If you're able then to, even if distillers are going out of business, if you're able to buy some of that stock and put out different blends that use some of that craft distilleries. And the nice thing about blending is you're always able to change your, your base product, your base blends and come out with new expressions. That might open the world to a whole new line of stuff that people might really get behind. And I think blending is going to really blossom out of the craft world. Um, and if you're able to do it right, then you know we as a consumer might get something really good out of this. We might be able to find the craft that we love and still support and that stays in business. And the ones that don't may end up contributing their, their well, quote unquote, craft, right? Their whiskey that they made to future blends that might actually go someplace and do very well. So it's a wild world for for whiskey right now. And, and craft is definitely playing a part in it, whether they like the part they're playing or whether they don't like the part they'll end up playing. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to do something, that's for sure. Well, to that to that point, Jordan, I I love craft. I lo I mean, I I can't say it enough how much I love uh, love it when I find a Driftless Glen, uh, Spirits of French Lick, a Journeyman. Um, you know, uh, I remember fourteen years ago when I found Finger Lakes Distillery, and I was like jumping up and down. And it's like you know, Finger Lakes Distillery is is no more known today than it was in you know 2009 when i first tasted it so i i don't know i i just i just wish that people could get could get on board and like taste and discover but everybody that gets in this hobby uh comes down to price and they're not willing to spend the money on a craft brand so those craft brands can keep the lights on. And Ryan, we were just talking about this in, in my office today about like how, you know, how people will react. And you're like, I, I see a bottle of whiskey and I see people trying to feed their families and keep their lights on and stuff. And I just think some of it is like there, the, the, a lot of the bourbon consumers out there just don't care. They don't care. Is it affordable and does it taste good? Those are the two things they care about. Yeah, I, that's a really good point. It's funny you say that because Ryan and I, we've done some in-store tastings and stuff like that. And we've given our spiel and trying to be like, hey, you know, when you're doing this, you're really helping support two guys that are trying to go on a mission and a dream, trying to make this brand a reality and we appreciate everything. And it's just not going to the hands of some major conglomerate. But to the most to the end of the day is what goes even back to Eric and Jordan's article here is that Five or ten dollars can make the biggest difference in all the world, and they don't care. They don't care if they're going to do that. And the hard part is that even as craft or NDP, we've said it before, you just don't have the economies to scale. There's no way that you can compete. I, you, you cannot tell me there is one craft distiller out there that can compete with your with Brian has with Brian's Heaven Hill bottled and bond six year at twelve dollars. Most that doesn't even cover the cost of goods for most people. Hell, sometimes the glass alone is $3. So at what point do you start making money on this damn thing? So there's no way that any kind of craft brand or anybody can compete at that sort of scale because they've got time and money and resources all at their disposal that, that ends up just kind of squashing the little guy at the end of the day. And I know Ryan kind of hit that hard at home is at the distribution level. That's where it gets really thick and scary because 
yes, they have margin points they can give up. End of the year, they have salespeople. They don't care. They just need to make their number. It's not that they, they can literally give away cases as long as they have cases sold or cases checkboxed at the end of the day. And so it doesn't really matter. Like they can literally give stuff away to the bars, to distributors, to whomever, just so they can carry their stuff and you don't see anybody else's products on the shelf. I got two points. First point is it's funny, you know, there's, we say they're all buying from the big six and they are, but they're leaving a ton of great whiskey that the big six makes on the shelf that, you know, that is available and ready to buy all the time. And they don't, you know, consumers just leave them, you know, rare, you know, rare breed. You brought that up, you know, just like regular standard old Elijah Craig. It's all, it's there all the time. Um, but they got to have Henry McKenna, you know, <clears throat> Fred, you know, <laughs> but thank you, Fred. <laughs> yeah. But there's, there's so much great whiskey that people have these blinders on of like, and, and I fall trapped to this too. Hell, I thought pickleball was the dumbest shit ever. And then I play it and I, you know, cause everybody's doing it. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I guess I got to jump on the hype. You know, it's, that's just a human thing, I guess. But uh, anyways, it's, it's just a fascinating how consumers behaviors and it's like, you got to follow the crowd and the herd. And uh, we think we're in control of our brains and thoughts, but we're not, we're really, you know, influenced by so much outside of our control. It's fascinating, you know, to watch people. That's what I love about these in-store tastings that like total wine and, you know, just seeing consumers habits and asking them questions of like, why, why do you buy this? Or why do you think that's it, it, it's, it's interesting, but uh Gosh, I had another point. I rambled on too much. Well, you want to tell some of your your funny stories from doing your in-store tastings? Oh, there's too many. (laughs) I had one person come up and, you know, I had my shelf talker. It said like the tasting notes of it said like chocolate orange, uh, you know, with burnt, burnt orange peel. And he's like, oh man, I've been waiting for a chocolate orange flavored whiskey for a long time. And I was like, this is not flavored whiskey. It's the (laughs) tasting notes. But he's like, oh, never mind then. (laughs) He He just walks away. But, uh. Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's a funny world out there. But gosh, I had something really good to say, and obviously it was so great I forgot it. Well, I, I want to just take a minute there just to pause because there's a. I know we've talked about it a few times here, and, and Brian Aiken brings it up too. He goes, "It's not just craft. It says right right now there's just too many brands. When you go on the shelf, you look at it. Is there an influx? Is there an overload of brands on the market?" And we talked about this, and I don't feel that we're going to see the end of it. In fact, it's going to keep going because whether it's a brand or whether it's LTOs, limited time offerings, or one-time releases, whatever it is, it's going to keep going. It's all the finishes. Everybody's just got to keep coming out with something new and new and new to keep people buying more stuff. And here's the thing is that you can go to most liquor stores, and you go and you walk down the bourbon aisle, and you're like, oh, God, there's, there's so much here. And then you go look at the wine aisle and you're like, well, never mind. It's really, there's, there's, there's a lot more wine than there is whiskey out there. Yeah. I, and the model of like having multiple SKUs, that business model uh, has been uh, proven to work quite well. And when you, when you do it effectively, Barrel is not a big company. You know, I mean, that's a hundred thousand case company. Which, you know, it's nice. It's very nice. But, you know, in comparison to like Willet or Four Roses, I mean, that's like a drop of the bucket for some of those companies. And um, they command a quarter of a shelf when you walk into a liquor store. They'll have all the various batches on there. They'll have the seagrass. They'll have the dovetail. And, you know, that when, when you do it right, it engages the consumers and it also gives you more real estate in a, in a liquor store. But when you do it wrong, when you do it wrong, and I'm thinking of one that I just, uh, when I just tasted, uh, the, the RD one, the RD one 98 proof and, uh, the 101 proof, you know, then it's like, the, you know, the liquor store makes a decision of like, well, which one do we carry? You know, they, they, maybe they carry both, maybe they don't, but like you, then you just get like a single slot. So, when you have those multiple expressions, I mean, that is your reputation. That's, that's, um, if you, if you have a couple of hitters in there, you're going to get more real estate on the shelf and you're going to bump somebody. So it's an effective, it's effective. And the limited edition, you know, kind of grouping was created by Buffalo Trace with their antique collection. And, um, you know, as far as nobody does a better, 
than than Sazerac. You know, what was the year that there was uh, like 15 different versions of Weller? Yeah, they just announced it one after another. And it's single barrel, and it's 107 proof, and it's full proof, and it's this proof. And it's like, for God's sake, you know, just pick one. You know, people eat it up though. They need those colors. They do. They do. But it's like it's like collecting baseball cards. What it comes down to. So I don't. I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. But I think there is. Uh, if I'm running a business, I wouldn't want to have all those SKUs. It just it looks like more of a headache to me to manage. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time, and this may be another topic. Is like, is the, you know, the everyday brand dead? You know, for whiskey geek or whiskey consumer, because like, to me, I, I think it. I love finding something I know that's consistently going to be good, and I when I purchase it, it's going to have similar flavors from the previous time. But it just seems like the consumer is constantly chasing the new shiny thing, and and so it's like is that sustainable, you know, and is that going to continue as a trend for whiskey consumers moving forward? It's going to be fascinating to see. Yeah. I think we'll save that for another round table. I think we can dive in more on that and dive into labels and, and sort of what's the, the thought process of the, the modern day whiskey consumer too, but let's go ahead and we'll kind of move on to a recap of our 2022 predictions. So we'll start off with, the guy who isn't here and let's talk about Blake and we'll kind of just talk about his real quick. Blake was almost like a catch all and, and it wasn't, it, it, it was very, I probably should have interrupted him when he was doing this. I said, you need to be more specific about what you mean because Blake, he had his, his idea was that there's gonna be a big acquisition. That's what he left it at. And I remember going back and I said, well, you know, you had Ross and squib with Luxco back in 2021. That wasn't big. He goes, well, no, that wasn't, that was really like a partnership. He goes, and it wasn't really, it was like something like smooth ambler and something like that. But in 2021 or sorry, in 2022, whatever year we're in right now, uh, you know, we saw bar Sound bourbon company, green river. And of course, wilderness trail was probably the big ticket item that we, we did see in regards of the, the acquisition target. So I think that, if you were to say every year that there's going to be a big acquisition, I'm sure that checkbox is going to get every single time. So uh, if 2023 predictions come around, when we get back together here next month, I'm going to make sure nobody says that. And if you do, you've got to be able to pull it off. And my God, as soon as we start talking about it, look who pops in. <laughs> I heard that somebody was asking he made it. Disney, Disney advice on the podcast. So I said, guys, I'll go live. I knew it was be, from a concession stand. I'll be on <laughs> location Cecil uh, outside the Dumbo ride. And <laughs> now we're the Dumbos. I had to give it time. Like I had to give Kenny enough time to drink a little bourbon, to not be completely angry with me when I come on with AirPods. So that's all, <laughs> that's all it was. <laughs> you know, what's crazy is this is probably your best internet you've ever had. <laughs> 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 it's not wrong. Uh, you know, Disney has a little better budget for Wi-Fi apparently than Sealbox. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they are really good topics. I was like, you know, I, I hate to miss these good topics and uh, had to keep the streak alive. So, hey, glad to be here. Blake well, from well, uh, Sealbox and Bourboner. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and he's out sign in sign out <laughs> and kenny's gonna mute you from here on out yeah and i'm done and now no, I got, actually I got like we, seven minutes until the uh fast pass of uh space mountain so we're set oh good well <laughs> we we were just talking about our 2022 predictions and mm. yours was that there was going to be quote a big acquisition this year which, oh. which I said, you know, Nailed I'm not going to let you get off that easy next year because I think it'll happen every year. So next year we got to be a little more specific. But yes, we did see I some think big acquisitions. Going to be a big relief. Man, he's gone. That's it. The mouse <laughs> found out gone. he was recording and cut him off. <laughs> All right, mouse well, wanted gonna, a piece of it. I'm going to go. Ahead. Oh wait, he's back now. Hold on. I, I said I think there's going to be a big release out of a major distillery is uh <laughs> my, my next prediction you know it's like a it's like a horoscope you can't be wrong can't be wrong all right let me go ahead and mute him now but so that was that was blake's so let's go ahead and brian so here was brian's prediction but he doesn't remember here is that he thinks that more experiments will become the premiumization not the standard mash bill, but you did note of things like Heaven Hill and Bourbon Bar that had some amazing releases at one point. And 
And so I don't think we we really saw this come uh, this year about having some of those because it's mostly these these back end things that they had done as experiments five, six, seven, eight years ago. And they were going to come out and say, here you go. Here's another $250 premium or limited edition offering. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. It's, it was a dud for a prediction. I might roll it over to 2023, though, because <laughs> they, I mean, double down. They've, they've got to have this stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's there. Hold on. It's I, I want to understand. I want to understand the prediction a little bit better. Are, are you saying like the the experimental stuff was going to be the limited edition products? Is that what you were saying? Yes, and that kind of came true only for Heaven Hill because they're saying now they've got their experimental one versus the the Parker's Heritage. So maybe there's one uh, just glimmer of hope for me there. But you know all these places have stuff stocked away that they don't know what in the hell to do with. I think that's coming out. Yeah, I think that's where Little Book comes in for a lot of the stuff from the Jim Beam portfolio. He he takes their brown rice and takes all the stuff and blends it together, kind of mm-hmm. creates something different. Woodford has their master's collection. There's yeah. there's yeah. each one usually has something. Fred said four rows are gonna get bought for 10 years, so you can keep <laughs> he's, he's yeah, still gonna hang on. Sooner or later, that's mm-hmm. gonna come true. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah so I I I think that might have been my prediction. I will c- carry it over to next year as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Fred, since you were speaking here, you had two of them. One, you said that barrel picks were going to be saved by regulations. Yes, of course, all that happened because that was we all we all kind of saw that happening. Nobody, the death of barrel picks was not going to happen in twenty twenty two. So we, I we don't felt, know felt good about that one. I don't know. They, you know, you leave it up to the lawyers and uh, and legislative uh, efforts. You know, you still got to fight. Well, and here was your your other one that. You know, now when you think about it, it, it was probably a, a long shot to make it happen just because of how fast the government works. But you said that the federal government will take barrel finishes are going to be out of the whiskey special category and they're going to make themselves something completely different. Yeah, they're still in the works on that one. But hey, I, I know it's it's in the works. So that's uh, that's exciting. Is that really a prediction then if you just know it's in the works? Uh, well, I mean, it's an educated, <laughs> it's an educated, it's an educated uh, uh, guess. I predict that Inside Fred's going to eat lunch tomorrow. I don't know what it is. I'm, a pr- I'm predicting he's going to eat lunch. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want me to start just throwing, uh, throwing uh, hay balls, I'll just go. I'll go again with uh, four roses will be bought eventually by some. <laughs> well, well, we'll figure out 2023 <laughs> when we get back in January here. Sure. Yep. Uh, Nick wasn't on this tonight, but here was maybe we'll just we'll just lump it under breaking bourbons here. If it's a good prediction, it's we'll take credit here. I'll take credit. If it's bad, then yeah, totally blame Nick. Well, it, it kind of goes back to your article. So Nick All said right. that small craft players will try to capture mindshare by coming online and doing more storytelling because most big players are the ones doing it. And he also said that he will think that more regulation will start increasing because bourbon hunting has gone too crazy and that. There's just got to be more rules put in place because so people are fighting in line and peeing in line, all that sort of stuff too. That happened. I mean, there's I mean, somebody yeah. in there's somebody in jail right now in Virginia. Like, and we got it right. So, oh, oh yeah, they. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. And, so there's uh, been there's been some crackdowns on that. Well, stuff. and PA just cracked down on their. They didn't really slap hands, but you know, no state employee can buy any of the limited edition bourbons anymore in the state. So they kind of oh, wow. took away that back end. So yeah, states are cracking down a little bit. Yeah, it's a. That's a so-so prediction. (laughs) Sorry. All right. So here's Ryan's. Ryan's was that he thinks that big distilleries will start creating $300 bottles. Well, I don't know if we saw too much of that, but I think that could probably easily carry over. And that toasting and wood finishing is going to flourish because you can make a distillate more approachable at a younger age. I definitely think I'm on that, on the wood (laughs) finishing. Hell, we just came out. I was going to say, you're guilty of it. (laughs) But I mean, there's a ton of them coming out. It's it, wait, I he think made it happen. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He it was for this existence. exact episode. I was like, <laughs> I got to make this come true. You know, <laughs> cut it out about a, two weeks ahead of time. Way to go. But Here. I mean, hell, you did see, you know, will it with the $250 eight year small batch? You saw, you know, Heaven Hills, you know, the William Heaven Hill line and Heaven Hill experiment, you know, at those higher price tags. So, I got well, a little bit right. It's, Russell's came out with one for what? Oh, that's right. Yeah. You yeah. know, know single barrel, barrel with their gold line at 500. I mean, the, the premium line is getting pushed higher and higher every year. That's for yeah. sure. I know. It's still, 
you, I see that it's every time I go to a liquor store, I look at that ga- glass case and I'm like, are these bottles going here to die or are they going to sell? You know, that's what I wonder. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's true for everyone though. And I'm sure that was part of your prediction, right? I'm sure we all have people reach out. I need to spend this much on a bottle, yeah. right? It's those, need. Those, right. It's a, yeah, those sell Christmas, Father's Day and Derby. Yep. That's exactly right. You go out with a certain dollar amount. It used to be a hundred dollars. Now it's 200 and you know, that decanter will check that box. Yep. yep. And if it's priced less, they don't want it. They need to right. spend that much. They more. need it. Yep. So I think Ryan was, was two for two here. There was a third one that Ryan had, and that's that Canadian whiskey will be accepted as premium. Oh, it's a little early, but maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to say, uh, yes. Oh yeah. Fred, we, uh, tr- yeah. yeah. I, I think that, that the answer for that is yes. And whistle pig is the great case study there. Uh, it is just not uh, Canadian whiskey being bottled by Canadians. It's being on the on the broker Americans market. who can market better. <laughs> I, you know, it, it is actually it's it's not that. It's just that they drink all the good stuff there. They just don't send it down here, you know. And I I saw I saw Don, Dr. Don in the in the chat too uh, earlier. But uh, you know, Canadian whiskey, I think. It's so good. It, it's so good, but they, yeah. you know, they screw it up. With, look, Crown Royal is like, screws it up. They, I mean, if you all could taste the original stocks that go into those blends, you would be so pissed. You know, I mean, it's so good by itself, but they have to blend it and screw it up. So, well, 2023, we'll take a field trip up there and, like just just hold it hold back. We're gonna form a picket line so they they don't make it happen there. And then my predictions were that 2022 was gonna be the year of throwbacks, so vintage packaging, vintage advertising, and stuff like that, which uh, somewhat kind of came true. I mean the 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 chicken cock stuff was kind of already starting there with their their tin can apothecary, whatever. We saw all the stuff come out of. Maryland, that's all MGP, but it was all those throwback labels there. I believe there is another throwback label that's recently came out that's 10 and a half year old MGP as well. So you've seen a little bit of it, but I think that might just be a fascination with every year. It's not just a, it was an, a major sort of spur. I know I saw some advertising, but it wasn't widespread. But that was one of those things that until goes back to our original thing is like until you see the big guys get behind it who knows if anybody actually pays attention uh, well if not i mean hardens creek right that's a throwback that that bottle design that label that's very much a harking back to old times oh, so Bird just said fortuna that was another one that kind of came out this past year too so yeah maybe i guess i was i'll, I'll take a i'll take a three quarters of a point <laughs> we'll do that all right, fellas. Well, that is going to close it out for this 75th community, Burby Community Roundtable. And it's going to close out our last community roundtable of the year. But, fellas, it was a pleasure once again to hang out with you for another 12 months of, of doing these and being able to get together every once in a while, making them happen too. So, looking forward to another year in 2023. But I'll go ahead and let you all sign off. We'll start. Going in reverse order. So, Jordan, you go first. Yeah, this is Jordan, one of the three guys from BreakingBourbon.com. I just wanted to wish everyone a happy holidays and more so. You know, it's a real privilege for all of us to take time once a month and do these community roundtables and really for you all to take the time to listen to us. So, happy holidays, happy New Year's, crack a good bottle of bourbon. We'll see you all in 2023. Or don't crack it, hoard it, you know, save it forever. No, I'm just kidding. Definitely, definitely open it up. There's always be more bourbon. That's what we try to keep telling people. Don't. Don't worry about it. You just keep opening it because they make more and more every single day. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, guys, for a great year. Looking forward to 2023 as well and our predictions next time. Uh, Brian with Sipping Corn, Bourbon Justice, all that. And uh, and I agree with Jordan's sentiment. It, enjoy some good bourbon over the holidays with friends and family. It's it's meant to, to be drank, and they're, as Kenny says, they're making more um, but enjoy it with friends. It's best that way. Cheers, everyone. And maybe try some craft whiskey. Try, yeah. Try, oh. <laughs> try some Pursuit United. Oh, there you oh. go. New Year's resolution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go <laughs> shop on Sealbox and get some Pursuit United. Uh, uh, sh- yeah, Blake Sealbox here, everything. So you know, <laughs> You're right. Up to him. Yeah. You, you can go get it at your local store then, too. You don't need to go to Sealbox. I'm just kidding. But 
Uh, definitely appreciate the shout yeah. out there. Uh, but again, I want to say thank you all for tuning in tonight. We had a little bit over like 112 at one point concurrent. So always good to have people on here. Thank you, everybody that was active in the chat and putting some good comments out there. I know I started a few of them and didn't get to them, but we had pretty much gotten to them at some point talking about a lot of the problems we did see in craft whiskey, whether it's the marketing, whether it's niche players, whether it's just lack of hype and everything like that. So uh, again, shout out to Jordan and Eric and maybe Nick had a little bit of hand in that article. It was a great piece to make sure that we start thinking a little bit more outside of the big six, even though they make great whiskey, but there's a lot of great whiskey out there with 2,600 plus distilleries. You can go ahead and get your fill of stuff. And I guess is what we've learned is always take advantage of those samples that are in the aisle. That's the best way you can do it is just make sure you <laughs> try it first. We see two dumbasses and they're handing out product. No, but seriously, how's a year past? I mean, time is flying by. I feel like we just, I remember making those predictions and I didn't until now, but, uh, it's a, uh, it's amazing how time's flying by. And so it's like during the holidays. Yeah. Just everyone just sit, relax, spend some time with the closest people you're with. Be present. Yeah. You know, really enjoy the moment with a good bottle of bourbon or rye whiskey, you know, from Baltimore or something around those areas. I'm kidding, but, uh, it's just whiskey is one of those great things. And this community is so great that it, it, let's just really try to be present this holiday season. Time is flying by and I just can't believe we'll be here next year. You know, talk about how stupid we were in January of 23 and how, how, how way off we were. So let's, uh, mm. let's enjoy these holidays and cheers. Everyone. So cheers, man. And, and, and on that note, you know, I'm in the middle of, you know, the, my third, disaster related bourbon auction is about to end and the amount of uh, love in the bourbon community you know stepping up and trying to help people is is amazing and you know we we always talk about how you know share a bourbon with someone you care about and you enjoy being around but the fact is there's a lot of total strangers out there you know raising money for people and by years in through the various, uh, you know, charities uh, that we've all been a part of, Bourbon will have raised around $7 million for various charities and disaster relief. So, I mean, that's something, you know, we should all be very proud of. And uh, if you are watching live or listening live, it's probably too late if you hear this on the recording. But uh, the Florida auction is uh, going to be closing on December 15th. So go to unicornauctions.com to uh, check that out. A couple nine-year Willets just dropped. Hey, yo. Good deal. Well, again, thank you all. Cheers, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>